So we'll be covering the second part of the Grignard reaction. So like I said last time, the Grignard reaction is a reaction that creates a carbon-carbon bond. And this is achieved by taking an aerial halide or an alkyl halide and reacting it with magnesium metal in some dry solvent, in our case, ether. And what's going to happen is the magnesium will complex with the halogen on the halide and it will form, um, it will insert itself between the carbon and the halogen, forming a carbon-magnesium bond. Now, again, this can be written as a purely ionic species, and this is because while the bond is covalent, it is highly polarized, which means the carbon has a partial negative charge since the electrons will be on the carbon most of the time, and the MGX will have a partial positive charge. I go more into detail with this in my previous lecture. So if you want to know about that, watch that one. But in this lecture, we're mainly going to talk about the experiment that we do. And the reaction we are performing in this experiment is reacting our uh, Grignard reagent with CO2 to create benzoic acid. Now we do this by, um, uh, we get bromobenzene and we react it with magnesium metal to create our Grignard reagent that we see here. Again, react it with CO2 and we get benzoic acid and we also get a, our principal byproduct, which is called biphenyl, which is these two benzene rings bonded together. Now, again, I'm going to show you the mechanism of this reaction. I did last one as well, but I'll quickly go through it. So we have our bromobenzene, we react it with our magnesium metal in dry ether, and we form our Grignard reagent. Now the Grignard reagent is a good nucleophile, so when we add it to solid CO2, it's going to attack the central carbon, pick the electrons up onto the oxygen, and it will create this benzoate intermediate, which we will protonate with some acid, that's what the H plus is, and once we do that, we will obtain our final product, which is benzoic acid. Now, we do this by using this apparatus, and I've labeled the constituents. Um, you see the first things that are new to us that we haven't seen are these drying tubes. These are filled with calcium chloride, and in this diagram, it looks like it's filled with liquid. At least that's what it looks like to me. But calcium chloride is a solid, and it absorbs the moisture in the air. So it prevents the moisture from coming into contact with our Grignard reagent. Now, the Grignard reagent is also sensitive to other gases in our atmosphere, like CO2 and oxygen. And the way we keep those out is by refluxing the ether. And that, since ether is very volatile, it's going to push out the other gases and just leave a blanket of ether vapors over our product. We also have this reflux condenser, which we will be running water through. Uh, this is so that when the ether is heated up, that the vapors don't just escape out of our apparatus. Instead, they will cool down in this reflux condenser, liquefy, and then fall back into our reaction flask. And we have this addition funnel. And the addition funnel is filled with a solution of our reactant, bromobenzene, and dry ether. And finally, I didn't label this, but our reaction flask, which is this large uh, three-neck round bottom flask here at the bottom. It contains some magnesium shavings. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna put the magnesium shavings in. We're going to put enough bromobenzene solution in so it covers the top of the magnesium shavings, so it completely submerges them. And then once that's done, we will close our separatory funnel and we'll get some hot water, put it onto our reaction mixture. Now this reaction is actually very exothermic, but it needs some heat to get going. But once it gets going, it produces a lot of heat and we don't have to heat anymore. So we'll just get a hot water bath, put it under it until we see that it starts reacting and we'll start seeing a lot of bubbles. And once we see that, we can take it off. The reaction has begun, it's begun producing heat. And we open our separatory funnel up again 
and let the bromobenzene solution drip in at a rate about, of about one to two drops per second, I believe, or a drop per second. And once that's done, we will wait until our reaction is complete. You will see that the solution starts cooling down. There's no more bubbling. And once that occurs, we will quickly take our solution and we will add it to a beaker containing solid dry ice. And while we're adding it to the beaker of solid dry ice under the hood, we will be stirring it to make sure uh, that the contact is good. And after that, once we've added all of it, we will slowly add some dilute hydrochloric acid to it just to protonate our carboxylate intermediate. Now, once we have this solid product, it's not pure. It is a mixture of biphenyl and our desired product, which is benzoic acid. Now, to separate this, we do exactly what we did in the extraction experiment, where we wanted to separate uh, methoxybenzene from benzoic acid, but this time we're just separating biphenyl benzoic acid. But it's the exact same idea. We're going to dissolve our solid mixture into diethyl, in diethyl ether. So we have a biphenyl benzoic acid mixture in diethyl ether. And both biphenyl and benzoic acid, they have very poor solubility in water. So they don't really dissolve in water very well at all. But if we deprotonate our benzoic acid and create the benzoate anion, this is a charged species and it's very polar and it has very good solubility in water. So what we do is we add the diether ether solution into the extraction funnel. Then we add a NaOH solution, aqueous NaOH solution. And we extract with that, we deprotonate our benzoic acid and our benzoate anion is going to go into the aqueous layer. You can see that here on the right. And the aqueous layer is more dense than the ether layer. So our aqueous layer is going to be on the bottom and our organic layer is going to be on the top. And then after that, you see on the left here, we're just going to pour off that aqueous layer, leaving the organic layer behind. We'll then drain the organic layer off separately somewhere else, clean the separatory funnel and pour our aqueous layer containing our product back into the funnel. We will then protonate our uh, benzoate anion using hydrochloric acid. We test the solution with pH strips. And once we see that it, they're red, which means it's acidic, we know everything has been protonated. And then we follow it up with extracting out our own. Oh, and when you protonate it, the carboxylate anion in the aqueous layer, you'll see that since benzoic acid isn't very soluble in water, when you start protonating, you'll see some white stuff start to precipitate out of solution. And that is benzoic acid precipitating a solution. So then we need to extract out all that solid using dichloromethane. And benzoic acid is very soluble in dichloromethane. So what we do is we add the dichloromethane. We shake the funnel really well. All our benzoic acid is going to go into our dichloromethane layer. And here on the right, we see that the top layer is the aqueous layer and the bottom layer, the more dense layer is our organic layer, which is dichloromethane. We drain off the organic layer and we obtain, and then we have a solution of benzoic acid and dichloromethane. And once we evaporate the dichloromethane, we'll have hopefully pure benzoic acid. And that's pretty much it for the experiment. Guys, use the data that he gives you in the video. He does a really good job of explaining everything in the video. And he gives you some really good data. He also gives you melting point data. And when you have melting point data, it tells you about the purity of your product. And when you have information about the purity of your product, you need to comment on that in your discussion. So I need to see that in your discussion. Uh, you also have to calculate theoretical and actual yields. So I need to see that as well. And again, he does a really good job. But if you have any questions about the experiment or the calculations, just please email me.